Divorce isn't just a legal battle, it's an emotional roller coaster. And today we're going to talk about all of the emotions in divorce and some ideas on how to handle it, including real life stories, because who doesn't like a little drama that really happened? Today we're going to talk about the inside scoop on emotions through a divorce process, what you can do, how you can manage, and how you can make it through to the other side. 100% of the time, I have had clients that say they are better off at the end of the divorce than they are at the beginning. Now, certainly this doesn't mean that every single person feels that way, but the emotional roller coaster, no matter how badly you want your marriage to end or you want out, is quite, I don't know, I'm, I guess maybe some people go to the amusement parks for the crazy roller coasters, but that's not what we want when it comes to emotions and our divorce process. Today, we're going to talk about what it looks like, and I'm going to give you a couple of questions that you can ask yourself with some tips on how you can handle this at the end. So stay tuned. Welcome to Gavels Down, Voices Up, where we flip the script on conventional legal discussions. I'm Rachel King, here to guide you through the murky waters of family law, estate conflicts, inheritance disputes, all of the dramas. We're not just talking about law, we're talking about how it affects your life, your rights, your future, and your money. From the courtroom to your living room, we bring you insights that matter. Dive into each episode ready to challenge, learn, and grow. Ready to change the dialogue? Let's begin. Gavels down, voices up. So when we're talking about divorce, we're talking about ending a marriage, and that's very, very emotional. And if you've heard me talk before, you know that I always recommend people that are facing a divorce or thinking about facing a divorce get themselves into therapy. Even if you can't stand the idea of therapy, getting a therapist can be a really great tool so that you have an understanding of what you're about to go through. And there's a method in place to handle some of these huge feelings because you're going to feel all of the feels and it's going to get quite emotional. I also, of course, say that you should have a lawyer and a support system, all of that. Why? Because it's quite emotional. Divorce is strewn with emotion and a therapist can help you get through it. A lawyer can help you see decisions from a different point of view so that you're not hooked on making emotional decisions in your support system. Well, they can be there when you're crying and they can be your cheerleader, even though maybe you're not always right, but you need all of those. And what I'm going to tell you, maybe you haven't heard, and that's that you can, you need, you don't have, you must grieve the loss of your spouse. This is true whether you had an amazing spouse or you had the worst of the worst spouses. You have to grieve the loss of your spouse. And we're not talking about death. We're talking about the divorce. Even in divorce, you have to grieve the loss of your spouse. And that's really hard for us to wrap our head around why a therapist is a good idea, actually. But it's hard because on one hand, you hate this person or you severely dislike them or they severely dislike you or they've hurt you, but you're not in love. And typically at the beginning of a divorce and throughout the process, you don't like them very much, right? But you still have this dream. You created a life together, whether that was an overnight, one night stand, fling in Vegas that ended up at the nuptials, or if it was a long-term life where you created children and watched them grow and did all of the journey through your, I don't want to say best years, but your mid years, right? Now, when that dream dies because of divorce, you have to mourn it. And that person that you can't stand, you have to mourn the fact that they're not going to be with you in this life. And your life might end up being much better, but it's still something that has to be mourned. And you have to go through all of the processes of mourning. I've dealt with a lot of people going through a divorce. Of course, I've handled divorce for over 10 years as an attorney. I've seen people be so ecstatic and elated that their marriage is over and the next day think that they should go back, that they're making the biggest mistake of their life and that their soon-to-be ex is their soulmate and everything in between. It is totally natural, as far as I've seen, to see people go up and down. And that's what I mean when I say a roller coaster. One day you're totally in love and you're feeling your marital bliss. And the next day you are thinking that divorce is the solution to all of your problems. And somewhere in the middle, 
you're thinking this is the best way for your life to move forward. And it can happen. I mean, just out of the blue, you can go through these huge swings and all of these emotions, they are normal. Not only are they normal, they're probably vital if you want to get through the divorce process as successful as possible. Let's not stifle the feelings. Let's feel the feelings and learn how to handle the emotions. So it's probably no surprise if I tell you that navigating a divorce is statistically one of the most stressful things and most challenging processes a human will ever have to endure. It's right up there with like the death of a child, death of a parent, death of a spouse. I think somewhere mixed in there is divorce. Probably because like I said, you have to grieve. You are losing something. You're losing your dream if nothing else, right? Nobody goes into marriage thinking, oh, I can't wait for this divorce to happen. And so it's really hard. So outside of the three things that I tell everybody they should have, a therapist, a lawyer, and a support system, let's talk about some of the other things that you can do to manage this roller coaster of emotions. One, mindfulness and meditation. I know maybe you're thinking, oh, that's so granola and hippie. Okay, but give it a shot. Don't think of it as mindfulness or meditation. Think of it as taking a moment for yourself to reflect on what you're feeling. Let all of that come up. Maybe you don't or you can't think about what's going to happen or the devastation and ruin financially that you are going through or how you really miss having somebody sleep next to you in front of your kids. Maybe you can't go over all of that while your children are present because it causes you to cry. So take a moment, meditate, be mindful, and allow yourself to feel those things, to think about those things by yourself and give yourself the freedom to do so. It will help you. And all of this is really important because the better you can handle your emotions through the divorce, the better you are going to be able to process all of your feelings, make more beneficial decisions for yourself. And at the end of it, feel as good about your divorce situation and the next steps of your life as possible. Okay, so let's talk about mindfulness and meditation. Real life story time. So Jan, she was a 45-year-old teacher going through a divorce of a 20-year marriage. She had a huge amount of anxiety, sleepless nights, all of this going through her mind, replaying every single conversation, every life decision, thinking about what was going to happen, where was she going to sleep, how was she going to pay the bills, was support going to come in where she thought. She was thinking about all of it day and night. She didn't have a history of diagnosed anxiety but it definitely developed through the divorce process and it was starting to interfere with her life. She wasn't sleeping and we all know that if you don't get enough sleep, you don't perform as well. Everything is going to become a mess. She wasn't able to be the mom that she wanted to be. She wasn't able to be the uh, ex-wife that she wanted to be. It was affecting her work, her life, her friends, every single thing. She just couldn't focus because she was so in her head and suffering from anxiety. She learned about mindfulness through a podcast. (laughs) Maybe you're learning about mindfulness from this podcast. I actually learned about mindfulness from the first time through the Nike Run Club app, and it was Andy Pettycomb, I think is his name, and I truly love him, but I learned about mindfulness that way. So, hey, me and Jane, we've got something in common. We both learned about mindfulness through a podcast, and she decided to give it a try because, quite frankly, maybe she'd heard about it before, but when she finally got the words in her head from the podcast, it was really at a point where she was at her wit's end and she was ready to try something new because previously she kind of chalked up mindfulness and meditation to all that hippie nonsense also. She really needed something that was going to slow her thoughts. And that's what the discussion of mindfulness was all about. So it resonated with her and she thought, oh my gosh, I'll give anything a try at this point. And so she did. She started with just five minutes a day. I think she told me that she downloaded an app, a free app, where she had to do very short amounts of time. She didn't think that she was going to have enough time in her life to implement, so she started with five minutes of deep breathing exercises every single morning when she woke up, before she even went in and got the kids. And on the days that she didn't have to wake up and get her kids ready for school, she said she still did it. Now I got this handy dandy Garmin and I actually noticed one day that it has a five or 10 or 15, I can't remember what, uh, minute 
deep breathing activity on it too. So I can just click through here if I want to. There's so many ways to find deep breathing activities that can really help with mindfulness. I'm really happy that Jane was able to do this. One of the apps, Headspace, I think that's Andy Puttycomb's uh, podcast. And I, again, I really like him. So Headspace, really great podcast and app if you are interested in learning how to get into mindfulness. In any event, Jane started doing this regularly and she told me that after just a few days, I think it was less than a week, she really, really found that her anxiety was going down. She had her first full night of sleep. I think she told me that her first full night of uninterrupted sleep was like five hours or something. So good start, but you can imagine if that was uninterrupted, what it was before this. She really was able to be present with her children when she had them and she had gone from having them full time in her house to now having a shared custody schedule. So she really wanted to be present when she had her children. She was also able to make better decisions in her divorce. Every time we would talk and we would meet, we would go over what she wanted. We'd revisit her goals. We'd relook at what was going on and how this journey was going to unfold. We'd also discuss the legal process and where that was. And I noticed that after a few weeks of taking this time and doing mindful breathing and taking some meditative moments for herself, she was able to make really hard decisions in a much more confident way. At the end of her divorce, she told me she was still doing it. I think she was up to something like 30 minutes and she had found so much peace. Even though the divorce and the custody and the financials were not playing out as she envisioned in her head and life might have been a little bit harder than, or maybe even quite a bit harder than she was expecting, she was able to find peace and joy in herself right then and love her life that she was living. And so Jane, Hats off to you. I love you. You're a doll and great job. I still do yoga too. I don't do my or headspace anymore, but I hope you are, Jane. Another thing that can be done, this is, we're going to look at a, another way. If mindfulness and meditation is not your thing, then physical activity. And anybody that knows me knows that I'm a big fan of physical activity. I go running three to five times per week. I love yoga. If you ask my kids, what does mom say about what's the cure all from mom, they'll say running and yoga. Mom always says, go running and do yoga and it'll solve all your problems. I don't know that it will solve all your problems, but I am a big believer in running and yoga. So talked about mindfulness. Some might say that yoga falls under mindfulness and meditation, physical activity. Now, though I do these, I'm not saying this is my list, right? This is a list of things that I've learned practicing family law and talking to other experts in the industry. But interestingly, I'm happy to say that so far I could check off too. So physical activity. I'm not even going through a divorce. Imagine if I was going through a divorce, I'd have to find something else or maybe I'd handle it really well. Who knows? Okay. So physical activity is another really great way to handle the emotional stresses of divorce. And let's talk about Tom. So Tom was a man that I met doing a, a divorce process for him. And he, 50 year old accountant, all of the stresses, he owned his own CPA firm, all of the stresses that you would think of an accountant. And he was really depressed after his wife left him. So he came into my office already really depressed. He didn't realize, he told me that his marriage was ending. His wife had probably been planning this for quite a while, at least emotionally. She didn't do anything weird when she, you know, was planning for the divorce. It's not like she hid money or took assets, but mentally preparing, she'd had a lot of time to process that her marriage was struggling and was over. Tom hadn't. So when he was served with divorce papers, it was a huge blow. They'd been married for a very long time. And he really wasn't expecting to find himself in divorce. In fact, I think when I met him, he was thinking about, you know, shortly before then, he was thinking about uh, selling his practice, winding down and having this fabulous retirement where he would be able to travel and spend all the time with his wife that he hadn't over the last 30 years or, or whatever their marriage was. Let's take a quick break. If you're navigating the twists and turns of divorce, you might be wondering, getting divorced, now what? That's actually the title of my upcoming book, designed to guide you through the challenging and emotional process of divorce. It's packed with real life stories, expert tips, and motivational insights to empower you every step of the way. While it's not available just yet, you can join the waitlist to make sure you don't miss out. Head over to rachelkingattorney.com to sign up to be the first to get a copy and enter to win a free signed 
copy as soon as it releases. Arm yourself with the knowledge to move forward confidently through this challenging time. Now let's get back to the show. Problem was all that time that he'd been spending at work had allowed or caused or been one of the factors in the downfall of the marriage. Nonetheless, Tom didn't see it coming when it happened. He was so lonely, he couldn't even get himself out of bed. I remember one time he told me that he hadn't eaten for two days because he just couldn't figure out how to get himself out of bed. He knew he needed to eat. And I remember him telling me, but don't worry, Rachel, I had some Ensure. I just took a, a case of Ensure to my bed and I made sure I drank them. And I thought, oh my gosh, you poor man, you should not be feeling this way. You don't have to feel this way, even though your marriage is here. Now, on one hand, maybe that's contradictory because I'm saying, gosh, you have to feel all of the feels. And it's true. Feel all of the feels. Allow yourself to feel all of the feels. But sometimes putting in these techniques, the mindfulness, the physical activity and journaling, that's another one we're going to talk about, can really help you feel the feels and move on. I didn't want Tom to be unable to get out of bed. I didn't want him to lose out on his social activities. Why? Because that affects his support system. Now he's losing out on his support system. And I mean, let's be honest, divorce is expensive. He was the primary bread earner, earner. We can't have his financial situation falling apart when he's very likely to be ordered to pay support. So we need to get his butt back to work. Anyway, he came into my office one day and I think it was one of the days where I hadn't showered um, before coming in. I'd gone for a run and I was running a little bit late. So I came in and he asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm so, I apologize. I said, I'm so sorry. I am training for an ultra marathon and I didn't have time to shower. And he was like, oh my gosh, he, he was very interested in this. Fortunately, he didn't hold it against me that I was in sweaty running clothes. Then he was, so he was asking me all these questions. I think I brought up Nike Run Club because I talk about it all the time. If you tell me you're about to get into running or you're running, I will say it's a free app. Go check it out. It's fantastic. So I think I said something like that. Well, the next thing I know, I see Tom posting on social media, all of these Facebook groups and on his wall that he is starting running intervals, a couch to 5k program, and he's really loving it. Before this, I had a hard time getting him in my office or on the phone to talk about his divorce process. I had a hard time having him agree to anything or even discuss potential options or issues within the divorce. After this, I didn't have to beg him for information. He started running and getting physical and he was able to be proactive in divorce. Not only did that help me quite a bit as his divorce attorney, it helped him, I think, really take control of a situation that he felt totally out of control in. So jogging was his thing. I think he ended up doing a marathon in like a year and a half. It was fantastic. And I always love a, a fellow runner. So Tom, I was so happy when you completed that marathon. It was great. Anyway, as I said, he did some kind of couch to 5K program, used running apps to help him get out there, was very successful and really leaned on running to help him make it through his divorce. But it doesn't have to be running. It could be any physical activity. And give yourself grace. Start with what you can. You're not going to go run a marathon or participate in the Olympics, but just getting out, having a little bit of intentional exercise. I'll give you a hint. That's what my therapist told me once. She was like, why don't you just focus on 10 minutes of intentional exercise per day, three times a week? I said, what in the world is intentional exercise? And she said, well, if your activity with your family is to hang out at the pool and you go swimming with your kids for the activity. That's not intentional exercise. That was your daily activity. If you do a hike, same thing. You guys are going to the beach and you're going to do a hike. That's your activity for the day. That's not intentional exercise. She said, so pick 10 minutes, three times a week to do something intentional just for exercise. I got to admit it's shameful, but my first, I think intentional exercise was like a 10 minute yoga session, five of which were like corpse pose, which is literally laying on your back. But hey, baby steps, baby steps, right? So when it came to the physical exercise that Tom was doing, right, participating in running, it allowed him to release his pent up emotions. It allowed him to be in his own head a little bit to think through those while he was also doing something physical so he could get rid of that extra energy. He lost weight. 
He gained confidence. So we have a 50-year-old middle-aged accountant who's finding himself back in the dating pool a little bit or maybe a lot overweight, looked aged, right? You can picture him, gray hair, wrinkles, the whole nine. But the running not only caused him to lose weight and gain confidence, it really allowed him to integrate with a whole new kind of person and create a circle of friends that he never thought he could have. Why was this important? Because again, we need to have our support system. So not only did the physical exercise allow him to process his emotions, it also gave him another outlet and one of the three tiers, right? A new support system. Uh, running really became a way that Tom was able to process his divorce. It was therapeutic. That doesn't mean that it took away from what I think the first of the three tiers are, right? Still have a therapist, but it was very therapeutic. And now we're going to talk about journaling. This is my third tip. And we're going to use a real life example. And I have to say, you know, I do the mindfulness and I do the physical activity. I have just never been able to get into journaling, but it is so beneficial. I hear from so many people. So just because I don't do it doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it because it is one of the top three ways that can help you handle your emotions through the divorce process. And interestingly, I've had quite a few clients come back and say that they revisited their journals from the beginning of the divorce and they're just shocked about how far they've come. They love seeing it and they really feel sorry and for the human that they were before. They're able to look at it and be like, oh my gosh, look at that person and how much they were hurting and look at my person now and how well I'm doing. So we're going to talk about journaling. Lisa. Lisa was a 38-year-old freelance writer, so already a writer. But even if you're not a writer, I think journaling can be really beneficial. So Lisa was a freelance writer, but as she went through her divorce, she was angry. You know, there's a, people handle their divorces a whole bunch of different ways. Some get sad, controlling. Well, anger is one of the emotions that you will feel, and it's one of the things that can really take over in a divorce. So she manifested her emotions through anger and really deep sadness, almost to the point of rage and irrational behavior. She didn't have a strong support system. They'd recently moved across the country, leaving all of her family and his family behind. And she found herself now having to face a divorce without anybody. Her husband was her support system and now he's gone. So now we're missing the entire third prong, right? We don't have any support system to help her get through this. Add on the fact that she hadn't lived here for very long, so she hadn't found herself a therapist. Most people don't unless they're in need, so we don't have a therapist, and she hadn't found an attorney, and she didn't have people she could go to and say, hey, do you have a really good attorney or do you have a therapist? So she was kind of left totally out there. She had nobody to talk to. And maybe that was why at one point she said she thought that was why her uh, divorce emotions really went so angry and so dark. One day, you know, you sw uh, swipe on your phone and you get all of these algorithm uh, articles. Uh, I will say that your phone is listening to you, though I don't know if it actually is. But in any event, Lisa got an article that was on her algorithm on her phone that talked about journaling. And that was her first real introduction to the benefits of journaling. Of course, as a writer, she knew how to write, but she was really focused on that as a career. She hadn't really explored journaling as a way to handle her own life and her own situations and also have it become therapeutic. She thought, I'm a writer and I can't stand feeling this way, I'll give it a try. What better way to learn how to handle your emotions than channeling something that you already do and have it be beneficial? So I think that's what attracted Lisa to journaling. She started journaling every night. She said she didn't really have time to journal in the mornings. Her head, she was one of those people that took a really long time to wake up and she liked her mornings to just be coffee with, um, with heavy eyes. So no worries. She told me that she liked to journal every night and she would pour out her whole feelings. Her journal once she shared a page with me and it really read train of thought. I don't think that it had punctuation. I don't remember any punctuation. And you know how when you're thinking, if you ever think through your train of thought, you just jump from topic to topic. Sometimes you don't ever even complete the thoughts. That was how her journal was. It was quite interesting. And actually, I think I went back and tried to do it one time and I was so in my head, all I could think about was how I was doing 
and train of thought writing. And I'm like, am I supposed to write train of thought down? It was, it was weird. Not what I could do, right? Journaling's not my thing, but she really liked it. And it was really helpful. Like I said, she poured out all of her feelings. She used the journaling space to write down how she was feeling and what was going on. And she was one of the people that went back and read her journal. And I think it was really helpful to have her look at how much she'd grown through the divorce process because she was so angry. She was so angry at the beginning. And then at the end, she loved the life that she'd created. She was able to make up with her ex, not to get remarried, but to continue to be friends. They actually found that they were really, really good friends, but not really good partners. And so she was able to find peace and clarity. Uh, and I think she really enjoyed watching that unfold in her journals. I wonder sometimes if she's going to ever turn her journals into a book or into a movie. Lisa, you should. I would totally read it. Journaling ultimately helped her gain clarity on her emotions. It helped her identify her patterns of behavior. So she did tell me once that she noticed that when certain, there would be certain trigger words and that would cause her to get angry. And she found out some of these things through her journaling. There were certain hot topics in the divorce process that would just cause her to kind of lose it. And it was through her journaling, she identified that. And then we ended up realizing that that was one of her deal breakers. And in a divorce, you always need to find your deal breakers. So they were such hot ticket items that as I was helping her with her divorce, I said, oh, that is going to be a deal breaker for you. We're going to, it is so important to you. It invokes such huge emotion and takes you kind of out there first, you know, process that. But second, let's not give it up. Let's have that be your deal breaker. You can't have everything be a deal breaker, but we were able to identify her deal breakers, which helped her ultimately reach a resolution because she knew that she was going to get the most important thing to her. Again, over time, she became less angry. I'm not sure if she's still journaling, though. I know she's still a writer, so she probably is. And then maybe, you know, like I said, who knows? Maybe she's going to turn her journaling experience through her divorce into a book. I think a lot of us would benefit from something like that, an insider's point of view. In any event, as you go through your divorce or as you watch somebody go through a divorce, realize that the emotions, they're natural. These up and down roller coaster totally supposed to happen. In fact, the people that are appearing to be even keeled through the divorce process probably aren't processing it. And it's going to happen at some point in the future. Allow yourself to feel the feels. If you're not liking what is going on, maybe you're overly stressed, incredibly anxious, sleepless nights, angry, depressed, sad, all of that try one of these things. Take some moments to be mindful or meditate. See if you can add a little physical activity or try journaling. You don't have to do all of them, so don't put so much pressure on you. Just give it a try. If it comes naturally and it seems to help, then maybe continue to do it because ultimately the goal is to become a better person through the divorce process and at the end of it to feel better than you did at the beginning. So whether you're Jane, Tom, or Lisa, here are some questions that you can ask yourself to determine whether you are emotionally fragile in a divorce. Again, that's okay. It's okay to be emotionally fragile. You will be at some point. But once you determine that you are, maybe a time to put in place some of these tips. One of the questions that I always tell clients to ask, do you feel overwhelmed by emotions more often than not? And are you struggling to manage your day-to-day -day responsibilities? For example, you can't really get out of bed to take your kids to school or you're having a really hard time remembering to make dinner or to get your make that doctor's appointment. If you're having a hard time with your responsibilities, it might be time to reevaluate how you're handling your emotions. Two, are you finding it difficult to enjoy activities that you once found fulfilling or relaxing? Probably you're going through a divorce. Some of the things that you did before, you simply can't do because you can't afford them or they bring back memories or whatever the case may be. So if the answer is yes to this and you're in a divorce, that's okay. It's just time to try and figure out what can be done to help you manage those feelings and find joy again. Do you frequently feel isolated or disconnected from others even when you're around people? Probably yes if you're going through a divorce, but... Finding an emotional support system, getting a therapist, understanding the law, and really taking the time for yourself to process your emotions can help you find the support system and feel that you are not alone. Because being alone through a divorce process is going to make it 
horrendous. It's going to take an already bad situation and make you feel even worse about it. When you're trying to redirect your activities, so I get some people that say, well, they get so upset in the moment, especially in court, right? And I have to nudge them and tell them, shut up. Here are some things that I like to tell my clients to do. Deep breathe. Take a moment to take a couple of deep breaths. Count your breaths. Inhales or exhales. I'm a big fan of breathing. I tell my kids to do it too. Count in for three, count out for three or five or whatever the case is. Deep breathing will calm your nervous system and take you out of the moment. If you're focused on your breathing, you're not focused on the outside stimulant. Do some kind of grounding exercise. Remember, we're talking physical activity. So maybe you need to focus on your feet touching the ground, right? If you don't have an opportunity to go for a run or go for a walk or do something physical, just focus on your feet touching the ground. Put your hand on the table if you're in court and focus on the hand touching the table. You want to ground yourself. And again, focus on something else instead of the outside stimulus and maybe draw. Do something creative. Again, when I'm in the courtroom with people, I tell them to doodle. If you can't help but doing the size and the emotional responses or you're getting too heated in what you're hearing, draw a picture. It's okay. Until next time, my name is Rachel King. I hope some of this helped you figure out how to get to the, through your divorce because ultimately once you get through your divorce, you get to move on. Until next time, gavels down, voices up. That wraps up another episode of Gavels Down, Voices Up. If you found value in our discussion today, please subscribe, leave a review, and share with someone who needs these insights. Your engagement helps us grow and impact more lives. I'm Rachel King, thanking you for listening and reminding you to speak up because every voice deserves to be heard.